Hello. So I'm really pumped to be the warm-up act for the snack break. And um, yeah, my name is Kenneth. I'm a front-end developer at Linkfire. We're a company that connects fans with entertainment, and we do that with Ember.js. And if you think that sounds a bit vague, I'll gladly tell you more after this talk. I also have internet access, so you can find me at Kenneth Larson uh, on Twitter, GitHub, and I have a website as well. Um, I'm also the co-editor of uh, the Ember Times, the great newsletter, um, so you should really subscribe to that. Or maybe join the, uh, the team and uh, write your own sections for the newsletters. Just reach out to me. Um, if you're not totally convinced to subscribe, I have a, a nice quote for you. I reread the Ember Times every single day. It simply makes me a better human being. Tom Dale. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, thanks. Tom didn't exactly say this, but I mean, I'm pretty sure he would if I asked him for a quote. Um, yeah. So if at any time during this talk you feel impressed by my work, then this is a link to my public fail log, where I log every time I make a mistake as a developer. So you can just feel free to laugh at me there. Um, but anyway, this talk is about community documentation. And what does that even mean? Well, for us, it means Ember add-ons. So I'll take you on an exciting journey in three parts. I'll take you through why it's important at all with community documentation, and tell you a bit about the state of the community documentation. And then we'll have a look at how we can improve this. Right. So why is it important? Well, usually. Documentation is the first encounter you ever have with anything when you're a developer, right? You look for add-on, you look through the, the README first, right, to see what, what is this even. And we really notice the documentation once it's lacking, because then we usually can't really do what we want, and we have to look into source code to figure out how it works. And this is especially true for new developers who are trying to learn. Not only are they trying to learn the Ember framework, but they're also trying to learn all these add-ons and figure out how they work. And that could be really frustrating. And it's also important from like a business perspective. So if I had a business and were to pick a framework, it just makes sense to pick one with solid documentation, that one that doesn't have solid documentation. But with documentation, it's quite interesting to think about, well, who is responsible for this documentation? So if I buy some proprietary software, I kind of expect that documentation is included and maintained by these people. That's what I pay for. Uh, and there might be community tutorials and stuff like that, but that's like an extra add-on because people are super nice on the internet. <laughs> then just like popular JS frameworks like Vue, React, and Ember. Uh, here I sort of expect that there's a team to facilitate documentation, but it's been written by a lot of different people all over the world, right? That's the core of open source. And for us, this means that we have an amazing learning team who sort of facilitates documentation and then makes it easy for people to contribute to this. But what about stuff like Ember add-ons? Well, there's like a common misunderstanding that if you were to release an add-on, well, then the maintainer is responsible for documentation. This usually results in documentation not really being there or not being great because you have to uh, spend your time in a wise way. That usually goes with bug fixes or releases and stuff like that, features. Um, so it's not really fair to say that the maintainer is responsible for the add-on documentation because an add-on is a gift to the community. So we are all responsible for the documentation once an add-on is out there. If you're using it, then it's also your responsibility. So what is the state of all of this? Well, uh, maybe some of you have seen this before, but a while ago I scraped uh, every single tweet with the Ember.js hashtag and wrote an article about it. Um, and there are some interesting things there. It's not really what this talk is about, but I wanted to sort of go back into this data and see, well, when did people start writing about add-ons? It turns out this is the first um, tweet about add-ons with the Ember.js hashtag. And it's six years ago this was made. 
um, and it's about bringing a Sprout Core add-on into Ember. And when I noticed it was six years ago, my head started to explode because just imagine all the stuff that can happen in six years on the internet, right? How do you even maintain that? It's, no, I don't want it. <laughs> and then four years ago, we could see that there were 96 add-ons out there for Ember, um, which I guess was impressive in 2014. I can't really remember. Um, but at least today, we have around 5,000 add-ons. Uh, that also makes my head hurt a bit, because how many of these are maintained? I have no idea. So in add-ons, um, we, of course, uh, think documentation is this bad boy, the readme mark markdown file. Um, and it sort of makes sense. This is how we've always done things. Uh, when you create a new repo, you can have this by default. And yeah, it's nice, right? The thing is, it's not really nice. Um, so the readme should sort of serve the purpose of a great introduction to your product or your add-on, and not as a, um, yeah, the big book you saw in the picture, right? Um, so there are some ways to make this into a nice uh, readme with a great overview. And one of these things are badges, right? Badges are super nice. Uh, you can easily see with the MP NPM package badge which uh, version is the latest. If you've ever upgraded a dependency, it can sometimes be a bit annoying figuring out, well, which version should I upgrade to? And then you perhaps find the release tab on GitHub and, and hope it, it works like that. Um, and the Ember Observer badge is extremely nice because, I mean, at least in, uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark, where I'm from, when I walk into a restaurant, just before I walk in, I can see a health report with a smiley face. And that smiley face can be very happy or very sad. And I know if it's very sad, maybe I should pick another restaurant. It depends on how hungry I am, basically. <laughs> um, so you can think of uh, Ember Observer as the health report of your add-on, right? And it's so good that I honestly think it should just come with the blueprint, but uh, it doesn't at the moment. Um, but it's really cool, and it's like a one click, and then you can see sort of the state of, uh, of your add-on. Then there's things like code climate and maintainability badges. Now, these can be nice and they can be absolutely horrible. Um, they can be nice because it allows potential new contributors to easily find a place in your code that sort of needs some cleanup. And that could be, surely be nice. But this actual badge is uh, from, from Ember Data. And it has a grade of C. Now, if Ember Data was a restaurant, I had to be quite hungry to go there. <laughs> but the thing is, I really like Ember Data, so it's not super reflective of the state, I'd say. And then lastly, we have stuff like test coverage, which is uh, an amazing kind of badge to have, because new contributors can easily see areas where tests are needed. And tests are a great way to get into a code base or like a first contribution. So I really um, think you should all use this. Then the thing with readme is, is that um, we like to have code examples in the readme file. And it tends to get a bit cluttered easily. Um, sometimes you have to scroll through a lot of code samples to figure out how, how you even install the atom. And there are some not so nice uh, results of this. So you often end up in maintaining documentation more than one place. So there's a readme and sometimes there's another documentation place as well and you have to keep track of these, these things. And it's, um, it clutters from important stuff like how do I even install this? What is this? Um, and I think we have a nice example from the community uh, of this. So uh, until recently, uh, the input data Read me, uh, look like this, uh, which is, yeah, I'm just gonna watch this. Yeah, so 
All the code samples you saw are also in the official guides, so they sort of have to be maintained two places. And Ember data is one of the things that I hear people, at least learners, new beginners, uh, complain a bit about having a hard time understanding. This could be one of the reasons it's pretty difficult to figure out where to go. Um, but they updated this, and it's really nice, and it fits in one slide now, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's easy to see where to go if you need API documentation or a usage guide or you want to contribute or whatever. This is super short and nice, and I think this is a, a prime example of a, a good readme file. So we could ask ourselves, well, why does it get this cluttered, even to begin with? Um, well, we have the blueprint stuff, where we have stuff like a contributing section. This might belong in a contributing markdown file instead, um, simply because it's cluttering way too much, and it's, it has different instructions on how to run the add-on than the installation instructions, which is pretty confusing for, for people new to uh, the Ember uh, ecosystem. And it also generates this section for you to write um, code samples and stuff like this, which perhaps should live in a different place. And I have just a solution for that, and I'll tell you in the third part of this exciting journey. So the main thing here is um, I wrote some pretty sick Ruby, and it made it possible for me to uh, scrape all readmes of every single Ember add-on and save it in a format I would later regret. <laughs> and um, it was really nice, and um, I sort of used the Ember Observer API. I'm sorry about that if anyone's here from the Ember Observer. Um, I don't think it was. There was a lot of data fetching from there. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I wanted to like, gather all this data and figure out, well, we've had add-ons for at least six years. Like, how does it look if we gather all this and try to do some analysis of, of the text and the, and, the, and the stuff? So I wanted to look a bit about uh, common patterns and common phrases. This is made with a tool called lang.ai. Um, and it sort of groups um, words and phrases into common patterns that uh, we then can uh, investigate. And if you are a quick learner, then you might notice a lot of this is blueprint stuff. Um, so you might think that's probably because blueprint stuff is pretty amazing, and why remove it? Um, once we look at the readmes, it turns out that it's basically because people are a bit lazy and don't really get to update the stuff. Um, so the blueprint is really dominating. I did some uh, tests where I removed all the blueprint stuff as well, but I think this is the true picture of our current state of the uh, Atom documentation. So the absolute most popular um, combination of words is, of course, test plus run. Blueprint stuff, it uh, shouldn't be first. It shouldn't be there at all, in my opinion. We should abstract all these things from the readme file. Uh, because this is actually stuff on how to set up stuff locally and contribute, not about how can I get started with this add-on. And um, second most important, you might think this is nice installation instructions, except this is not how you install an add-on. Um, this is how you run stuff locally when you want to contribute to an add-on. So I'll refer to the previous slide on why that shouldn't be there. Um, then, once we look a bit away from the, the blueprint stuff, we have some really nice things like uh, Score plus Observer. So this is the eighth most popular combination of all our 5,000 add-ons. Uh, this is really nice because it means that people are using the Ember Observer badge in the readmes, you know, the health report. And it also suggests, once again, that it's quite popular and perhaps it should be default uh, in the blueprint. And this is the fourth most common. Um, and you might think, why is this? But this is from all the code samples we have. Uh, this is actually original contributions that are not blueprint, but yet it's uh, a lot of code samples that perhaps shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, but yet they're there because it's convenient to write it there, I guess. 
then we have number 10. And this, um, yeah, this is a bit of a pet project of mine. I'm not going to go into why you shouldn't use transforms. But um, there's a lot of uh, examples here with models. And um, I looked into it, and almost every single example used transforms. Now, it's not important why you shouldn't use transforms. You probably shouldn't, but it's not important why right now. Um, the thing is that when we looked at the documentation, um, transforms weren't necessary for the add-on to work. It wasn't necessary for the example to work. It wasn't necessary at all. And this creates a lot of confusion and overhead, and it, it's overcomplicating our code samples. So what a lot of people think, and what I thought when I started with Ember, because I saw code examples like this, was, oh, how nice. I can set a type here of string. But that's not really what happens at all. It transforms your API response to a string. And that's not super nice if you don't want it. Um, and it's not super performant either. Um, so it looks like we tend to overcomplicate our code samples with introducing concepts that are not really relevant to what we're trying to teach. And then I think the most mind-blowing discovery of all is the next two words I'm going to show you are quite popular, and it kind of shocked me. Um, <laughs> And I don't only say this to be funny, I also do, but it's not. This is more popular than Robert Jackson. <laughs> How is that possible in the add-on community? So I just had to spend a lot of time digging into this. Um, it turns out that if you have an example, <laughs> you use Tom Dale. Um, so in the world of Ember add-ons, Tom Dale is the human fubar. Um, yeah. He was really cluttering my data. Now, this, these were all common phrases. Now we sort of have an idea of where we at with all, all of this. Then I want to run some other kind of um, analysis. Um, so I wanted to look at stuff like unhelpful phrasings. And you might know it by simply run the test, just type npm test, or just write your own compiler, then it simply works. <laughs> um, it's stuff that's relative to the user's knowledge, and especially with the last one here, it's not really helpful, right? Um, and it's something we see often. It's something we don't think about when we write it, but there are some tools to like catch this stuff. Um, so I used some of these tools on. Um, on all the 5,000 readmes, and I found 995 cases on all unhelpful uh, words. And you might think, ah, that's quite a lot. Um, it turns out that it's like 0.07% of uh, all words in our readme documentations, which sort of suggests that we're doing OK. But still, there's, there's cases where we're not so good. So I'm going to take you through what's, um, what's happening. right? These are sort of the words we usually look for, just simply, simple, actually. You know that guy, right? And easy, easily, obviously. These are all words that not in any way at all helps your documentation. It's, uh, it's pretty annoying, it's arrogant, and it's just unhelpful. And we, we do it without thinking, at least. A lot of people do. Um, so in the third part of this journey, uh, journey I will I'll show you some tools for, for fixing that. Um, so that's one thing. Also had a look at inconsiderate writing. So that's usually defined as gender favoring, polarizing, race related, religion inconsiderate, or other in unequi unequal phrasing. Yeah, that's not my quote. Um, and it's something that the development community is sort of known for not being good at, not being super inclusive. I think we're doing really well in the Ember community. Um, so I wanted to look at how we did in our uh, add-ons. One thing, though, I used some automated analysis for this. And since programming has an unfortunate vocabulary, um, 
there tend to be things caught that you know sounded really bad, but perhaps wasn't bad because it's like programming term, right? So when I say kill the program, I don't mean that you should go and shoot someone. It's more of a, right. So I found 2,359 cases of inconsiderate writing. So this is a bit worse than the unhelpful stuff. Um, and as I said, some of, it, some of it is programming terms. Uh, some of them might not make sense to change. Some of them I think we should consider changing. Uh, and I know when anyone talks about changing programming terms, there's always like, oh, it's always been like this, oh my god, you know. Uh, why change anything? Um, but just think about it, it might, might help people feel a bit more included in the community. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples that I found in our community documentation that we might consider changing going forward. So one thing is master-slave. It's quite unfortunate term, right? It's, it doesn't represent anything nice at all. Um, but there's a great alternative called primary replica. It's not only is it not offensive to anyone, but it's honestly also a more precise term for the concept. Um, yeah, not telling you what to do, but you should consider it. And the same goes with disabled. Turned off is just a precise term as disabled, but it doesn't have any connotations of, um, of being offensive. So you, I think you should consider that. And then a more difficult part of open source is cultural differences, right? So you have people from all over the world contributing documentation on technical concepts, and it can get weird sometimes. Um, one example of this is from, well, if you remember the fail log, here's an entry from the fail log. Um, so in the Ember Times, I wrote a section uh, where I wrote this. Um, and so for me as a European citizen, I, I honestly did not think of anything with this sentence. To me, this meant nothing. Um, I was just writing a section at work trying to finish it, and I wanted to express that there are initiatives to make the CLA, uh, CLI documentation great again, apparently, but we wanted to improve it at least. Um, and then I made the PR, it was accepted, the newsletter went out to all the subscribers, and we also have the issues on the Ember blog. Um, and then I noticed this sort of hot fix from Jen, from the learning team, about my uh, contribution. It says, update some blog text to be neutral. I understand that the phrasing was meant as a joke, play on words, but I associate this phrase with causing a lot of harm to a lot of people. And as I was about to write a comment that I was so, so sorry, I really did not even mean it as a joke. I, I didn't have that connection. Uh, I didn't even get to write this part before other nice people in the core team were like, yeah, I really agree. And uh, then I was just slowly drinking my water and, um, <laughs> you know, keeping cool and, you know, like um, trying to fire, to dig a hole that I could live in. Um, but it just turns out that apparently we see these things differently, right? I'm a, a stupid Dane who doesn't understand American politics, and uh, I apparently offended a lot of Americans, and it was truly by accident. But stuff like this happens, and it, uh, it will always happen, also in our add-on documentation. Um, so it's something to be beware of. There are no great, great tools to, to fix this. Uh, I hear free school is a good way of fixing this, but I know not all countries have this yet. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now we should stop laughing um, <clears throat> because we have to talk about this part. Um, I looked a bit about how we write about gender stuff in the uh, Ember add ons. And 
I want to say on an overall scale, we're doing okay, but we do tend to repeat some of the same patterns that we see in a lot of places in the open source community. And that is always using words like he, his, guys, and dude in the, yeah, this is from the readmes. Um, and you might think, why is this even in the readme? But stuff like that apparently happens sometimes. Um, and it is an issue because it's extremely exclus exclusive to people who are, doesn't identify as dude. And um, <laughs> it's not really nice and it's something that's so easy to fix. Like, it's so easy, so we should really consider stuff like this. And there will also always be cases like this one add-on developer I found in the, all the data who maintains two add-ons. And in both add-on readmes, he used the, words, uh, the word horseshit. And in different scenarios, <laughs> it's sort of amazing, but also really unnecessary. So just to sum a bit of, uh, up about this, the state here, um, the readmes are too cluttered. The blueprint documentation needs adjust, adjustment. And we need a separate space for documentation. And we're doing OK with inclusive writing, but we can do better. And cultural differences will always be there, right? So how can we improve it? Well, first of all, there's an, an amazing tool out there called Ember CLI add-on docs. It allows you to, it basically is a simple Ember install, and then it allows you to write markdown documentation within your add-on, and it provides a beautiful web interface for you to explore this documentation. It allows you to create interactive component demos, which is super helpful when you want to check out an add-on and you can see the component in real life next to the code sample. And it also works with auto-generated API documentation, so you only have to sort of maintain your API documentation within the code, and then the add-on makes it beautiful for you. Then there's a tool called Retext Assuming. Now, this is for finding unhelpful phrases. So to use this, you should simply just install it with NPM, and then it works. Um, yeah. It works sort of like a linter, so it's pretty easy to set up. Um, and then there's Alex, um, a tool for finding offensive language and stuff like that. Uh, there's also an Ember CLI Alex, which uh, haven't been updated for a while, but it allows you to run Alex within your test, uh, test suite. So when you run your tests, uh, it will also run through your code and your documentation for offensive language, which I think is, uh, is pretty nice. But all of these tools are, um, you know, mainly for maintainers. So what if you are just a contributor who wants to join the quest of fixing uh, all, all of this documentation? Well, I have something that's very much work in progress, uh, so much that I just pushed it to be ready here. It's not, I wouldn't recommend using it yet. But the idea is it's a CLI tool that fetches an add-on for you, runs all of this analysis for you, and provides you with a list of issues to fix. Um, so if you're a real go-getter, you can use this. Uh, so I have a short demo of this. Um, in the example, it uses a specific add-on, but, but the ideal case is that it can fetch an, a random add-on for you. Um, so it looks like this. It's called Nice Docs, by the way. Uh, yeah, so this is doing the analysis of, it's not so pretty yet, it's doing the analysis of, uh, of uh, offensive language on an Ember add-on uh, without you having to npm install any of the tools or, or whatever. Uh, so hopefully it can be a nice way of making it easier to fix some of these issues we have, or at least discover them. Yeah, so what did we learn? Documentation is crucial for a healthy community. We are all responsible for the add-on documentation. The README is currently too cluttered, and so is the blueprint. And the level of considerate writing is good, but can be improved. And there are tools to help you use them and make them default. Thank you for listening.